me throw out a question and again I'll go back to something that Isaac Ehrlich mentioned and that is um, how we uh, add to our pool of human capital not only by educating people here but by uh, importing um, human capital from elsewhere around the world and uh, certainly here at the Rockefeller Institute and, and elsewhere in higher education we, we see that. Uh, would you like to comment on, the, uh, on that um, other than uh, the obvious fact that we we do have the benefit of a lot of people coming from around the world to uh, our campuses here in New York. So, um, I think that's an interesting dynamic that's changing. And the question that I had, Doctor, wanted to ask Doctor Ehrlich is is his feelings in the future in terms of the direction that that was going. We see a lot of competition overseas now in higher education. China and India are making significant investments. Uh, the EU is restructuring their uh, post-secondary education structure, their higher education structure. Um, at the same time, we see uh, institutions across the United States making significant investments overseas. Uh, SUNY is very aggressively pursuing programs in China, Singapore, Turkey, or major areas where uh, we're involved. We're even seeing community colleges uh, showing some interest. Uh, it's very small. So, but it's a very interesting dynamic, and it'll be interesting to see whether as uh, the pool of human capital overseas increases locally in those countries, whether that dynamic of uh, workers coming, skilled workers coming to the United States begins to change, and what impact that would have on uh, the, both the national and, and the New York economy uh, could be significant. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just take a couple of minutes to answer that. I think the question is very interesting. I'm going to Singapore in about two weeks to participate in one of the SUNY programs that we offer overseas. So I have a keen interest in the question that you're asking and why is the demand for these organizations. Uh, I think, speaking for myself, I'm not that concerned as others might be about whether or not the United States is going to lose its leadership in the world, although I think it is a very important issue for our people. As an economist, we believe in liberties and opportunities for all mankind. I don't see it as a minus for us that the rest of the world will grow along with us. So, what, what's good for us is good for other places in the world, and I think that what's happening in the EU in particular, I think, is they're related this time. They have been behind us in the formation of human capital and their attempt to attract, especially the Eastern Europeans, who are now free to move in the, in the EU to come to the institutions of higher learning. Um, at the same time, I think in the final analysis, and I think that that is an important part of my talk, um, it's not just a question of who produces human capital, or where human capital stays, where does it go. So as long, I think, as the United States will continue to be an attractive place for people to come to, and I should say not just because of the earnings, although earnings is a very critical part of it, but because of the quality of life, because of the openness of our society, because of our democratic traditions, because of our egalitarianism, at least relative to the rest of the world if we started 150 years ago. As long as this continues, I think our leadership could continue as well. Can I just, yeah, I'm sorry, just to add to that. I, I agree and, and disagree with you just a little bit. And I, I think I was fortunate last week to go out to Syracuse to listen to uh, Vice President Biden Tim Geithner and um, uh, Secretary Duncan in their middle class tour that they're doing, which is focusing on higher education. And one thing um, Tim Geithner did focus on is the fact that the United States has lost in its stature versus other areas of the world. And that is a concern. Um, I, I agree with them, it's a zero sum game. But I also think that the Vice President, the President has acknowledged the fact that we do have to invest um, you know, locally in the United States and our own institutions so that we can continue to compete. Where you see overseas, there are many new campuses being built, there are many new programs. This is something that we have to continue to be cognizant of and continue to grow.
grow our programs and our universities in the United States also. I just want to add that. I don't disagree. I don't see the disagreement. I said we disagree. I guess what I just add is to take the uh, discussion from looking at international migration movements. A lot of the same principles and concepts apply when you start thinking about migration within the same country, in particular the U.S. And and to, to Isaac's point about uh, human capital production, ultimately what matters is where it sticks. Is, is in thinking about how universities influence uh, the local economies. It's important to think about more than just the producing of new graduates into the economy. Uh, obviously, migration forces pull those people to where their best opportunities are. Uh, and, and I guess I would just pick up with what Laura was saying at the end, which is that uh, it's important to also think about the influence that universities can have on the demand side, in particular through R&D efforts. And I think that if you look at the policy debate, my sense is uh, that that actually gets a little bit um, overlooked, although I guess recent efforts by uh, Governor, Governor Patterson setting up this task force and so forth are, are moving in the right direction. But, uh, it's not just all about producing students and hoping that they're going to stay. It's giving them a reason to stay. And uh, one of the most promising tools to do that is through R&D and through the spillovers from universities that influence the demand side of the market. Uh, do we have a question over here? Uh, OK, one quick question, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Well, uh, Fred Barney, I still know my name. The, the observation is made about the computation of an index that you use to make some statements about human capital. That index looks like it's composed of ordinal numbers. Am I interpreting that correctly? Which, which index are you talking about? One, two, three, four, five. Well, yes, it is. Okay. In the product of three times four is 12, but when you have ordinal numbers, the third plus the fourth is the 12th. I'm the not other, sure I understand the question. Uh, it's just a comment about what every introductory psych student knows, the difference between ordinal measurements and interval. And right. the last question is, how many public engineering schools do we have in the state? Let me, let me take the first question first. So, yeah, measurement is always very difficult. Uh, and in this case, uh, in particular, very difficult. So I take your point that there's a difference between a cardinal and an ordinal score. Uh, yeah. And so in order to, to, to get at that, we've, we've standardized everything, demeaned everything, and looked at just changes in standard deviations. It doesn't, um, it doesn't completely cure what I think you're pointing out, but it's, it's, it goes a long way towards, towards I think, uh, getting at um, and, and, you know, what we're trying to do is new and it hasn't been done before. And so the uh, decision is do your best and push something forward that might have some limitations or nothing at all. And I think we're going to, we would choose to try to uh, make something of it. Uh, and, you know, we have obviously looked at a lot of different ways of computing these indexes and we're relying on some existing literature uh, that has sort of pointed us in this direction. So I, I think while the point's noted, um, it's something that we've thought a lot about and we feel pretty comfortable that what we're picking up in broad terms here is not a result of the way the index is calculating, it's picking up something real. Um, with respect to the question on, on how many engineering schools are there, that, that I just don't know. I don't know how many engineering schools there are. Dr. Porter here. Yeah, no, I don't know either. I can't speak for CUNY. You said public engineering schools? Yes. I know SUNY has uh, their, you know, we have our four research centers. They grant uh, engineering degrees, and then we have uh, probably another 15 that at, uh, at different levels. You know, you have a two-year, and you have technology engineering, technology degrees as well. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists.